Good morning and welcome to one of the first live streams for our Y Series event here in London. My name is Alex Stark and I'm one of the fellows here at the Oxford Centre for Christian Apologetics. You're about to hear from Sharon Dirks, one of our apologists, address one of the most fundamental questions to being human. Am I just my brain? Sharon has a PhD in brain imaging and she's just released a book under the same title, bringing together both of her contemporary research interests as well as her own academic background. Sharon is well equipped to unfold for us what contemporary biologists, philosophers, theologians and psychologists are all saying about this question. So stick around for our Q&A at the end that Sharon will hold with our live audience here in London. But without further ado, sit back, grab a notepad and pen and feel free to engage this question for yourself. We hope you enjoy. On the live stream, welcome. It's great to have you with us. Um, and to be able to join uh, us for this session with Dr. Sharon Dirks. And why don't we just pray as we um, get ready for you to start. Father, we pray for Sharon. We thank you, Lord, for what you have skilled and gifted her in. Lord, for the past and the academic expertise that you've now brought to bear on this subject, which is becoming one of increasing contemporary debate. Lord, will you help us to understand and appreciate the significance of uh, the questions which are being raised and Lord, we pray you may anoint Sharon afresh as she comes to share with us now. Amen. Uh, let's welcome Sharon as she comes to share with us this morning. Thank you, Michael. Thank you to everyone for coming here today to discuss and think about these questions. And may I also extend my welcome to all of you joining us on the live stream. At the heart of uh, the questions we're looking at today is this. What is the most important feature that makes you a person? This is asking a question about human identity. What exactly are human beings? Are we advanced primates? Are we machines? Are we souls confined to a body? Are we just physical beings, or is there more to us? Many answers are offered to this question. One of the ways that this question has come to the foreground again is through the writing of Yuval Harari. Yuval Harari is the author of two best-selling books. He has written Sapiens, which looks at the history of humankind. And he's also written Homo Deus, which looks at the future of humanity. And these two books together have sold millions of copies worldwide. Now, Harari writes brilliantly and eloquently. And one point that he makes in Homo Deus is that humanity may not have much of a future left. We're only a generation or two away from inorganic life forms outperforming human beings in all kinds of ways. And he argues that this may lead to a redundancy in the human race. Jobs that were previously taken by humans will be done by computer algorithms and to a much higher precision and efficiency. He gives the example of driverless cars, which is in the process of being implemented and when it's um, uh, you know, optimized would vastly reduce the number of accidents on the roads. He then goes on to give the example of medicine, how he foresees a day when people will not speak to a human doctor, but to an algorithm, which will be able to more accurately hold more information about your medical history in their data bank. They will always be at peak performance. They won't be sleep deprived. And they may able, be even able to monitor your biometrics while you're speaking to them, your heart rate, physiological factors. And therefore, this will lead to a much better diagnosis and the, more, uh, the greater likelihood of offering correct treatment. And IBM's Watson is very much working to this end. Now, some of this may well be true and is already in the process of implementation, but it raises an important question. Will algorithms replace humans in every sense? Well, the answer that you give to this question depends on how you answer the question that I mentioned at the start. 
What is a person? In Homo Deus, Harari asserts that over the last few decades, biologists have reached the firm conclusion that the man pressing the buttons and drinking the tea from a vending machine, that's the context of the quote, is an algorithm. Humans are algorithms. And he makes similar assertions about the source of human emotion in making the case that an algorithmic doctor will be just as emotionally intelligent as a human doctor. And in a lecture at the Royal Institution, Harari asserts that emotions, at least according to modern science, are not some spiritual thing that God gave humans in order to appreciate poetry. Emotions are a biochemical phenomenon. Therefore, it's extremely likely that Watson will be able to diagnose my emotional condition just as it diagnoses my illnesses. In other words, humans are machines. You are the biochemistry in your brain. And there is nothing about your inner workings that can't be replicated artificially. You see, what you believe about the nature of the human person impacts the predictions that you make for the future of humanity. If humans are just machines, then they are upgradable with a new, improved, inorganic version. What shall we make of this view? Well, I want to look at some of the beliefs and assertions that lie underneath this perspective, and that's really what my book is about. It's looking at the things we need to think about that lie beneath this kind of assertion. Is it true that people are algorithms, that emotions are chemical reactions, or is there more to it? This um, diagram um, shows all of the chemical reactions going on in a cell at any one time. It was one of my favorite, slightly nerdy, diagrams when I was a student. There are millions and millions of reactions happening in your body without you even thinking about it. If you thought you were busy now, you definitely are. But does this give an exhaustive account of your thought life? Now, let's be clear. The human brain is incredible. It is extraordinary. I once had the opportunity to see a brain removed from a human cadaver during a neuroanatomy course. It was a sobering and awesome, in its original sense, experience. Can we go back to the previous slide, please? You'll be pleased to hear that the human brain is, or maybe not pleased to hear, the human brain is not unlike the consistency of mushroom. But rest assured, you do not have mushroom sitting between your ears. This incredible organ comprises just 2% of the body's weight, but uses 20% of its energy, despite being nearly 75% water. It contains more cells than there are stars in the sky, between 80 and 100 billion. And at any time, the brain generates enough electricity to power an LED light brings a new perspective to the idea of a light bulb moment. Our understanding of the human brain has grown exponentially in the last few decades, not least through modern brain mapping techniques, which was my area of research. But many would agree, next slide, that two very different things are being described in what Harari talks about. You see, emotion is a component of the mind, the inner world of the person with all of its thoughts and feelings, emotions, memories, decisions. Biochemistry takes place in the brain with all of its neurons, electrical activity, hormones, and chemicals. So the key question we need to be asking at this point is what is the relationship between the mind and the brain? Next slide. That is the million dollar question. And this has been debated for centuries. 
This is known as the mind-brain problem. What is the relationship between the brain and the mind? How do you get from brain cells to thoughts? How do you get from electrical activity to, I'd like to play tennis today? How do you get from brain chemistry to, I've had a really hard day today? Is it even possible? Next slide. And the next. Marilyn Robinson, the novelist and essayist, in her book, Absence of Mind, makes the important point that whoever controls the definition of the mind controls the definition of humankind itself. Next slide. The perspective driving some of this discussion is that the mind is the brain. Those that believe that you are just your brain believe that mind and brain are identical. Mind processes are brain processes. And this is known, broadly speaking, as reductive physicalism, which says that the mind is reducible to physical processes in the brain. And that's another way of saying there isn't really anything such as the mind. There is only the brain. This belief originated at an academic level. This is not a new idea. One proponent Simon already shared. Another is Sir Colin Blakemore, an emeritus professor of neuroscience at Oxford. In his Reef Lectures in 1976, he said this, the human brain is a machine which alone accounts for all of our actions, our most private thoughts, our beliefs. All our actions are the products of the, the activity of our brains. Now, Harari states that scientists have reached a firm conclusion about this. But this is simply not the case. In fact, Harari is a historian. He is not a neuroscientist. If you ask the scientific community, you will see there is by no means a firm conclusion on the relationship between brain and mind. Despite throwing the brightest minds in the world at this problem, there is no consensus. Let me try and explain why. Imagine I ex uh, ex asked you to describe to me the smell of coffee. Next slide. Probably a number of you picked up a coffee on the way here. Describe to me the smell of coffee. And maybe describe it physically for me. Describe it in terms of physical things. Well, what would you say? You would say, I can't really. You need to smell it. And once you've smelt it, you will understand. I can't really reduce it any further than the smell. And in fact, showing me the chemical structure of caffeine is not going to get me any closer either to understanding the smell of coffee. You see, ph philosophers talk about qualia. And qualia are qualitative, back please, are qualitative experiences that are very uh, difficult to describe physically. Things like, could I have the previous slide, please? The one about qualia, thank you. Uh, very difficult to describe physically. Things such as the taste of watermelon or seeing the color red. And the reality is that brain processes alone are insufficient to explain qualia. Imagine we wanted to do an experiment to figure out what it is like to revise for an exam or write a report. Next slide. Imagine we'd said, OK, we're going to put an EEG cap on you. We're going to measure the signal from the surface of your brain while you're writing all of these reports, while you're revising for this exam. Does this tell you what it is like to revise for an exam? Well, no because we need to talk to you as well. We need to ask you, what is it like to cope with expectations and pressure and internal drive and stress? You see, brain processes alone are insufficient to account for qualia. Similarly, if you were to cut your finger, we could describe physically all of the processes from your skin receptors to your brain and back to your finger. But at the same time, you experience pain. 
When you eat chocolate, we can describe the reward uh, parts of your brain all firing as you enter that happy place. At the same time, you experience the taste of chocolate. You see, brain processes and human experience are not the same thing. And how you get from brain reactions to conscious experience has occupied philosophers and scientists for centuries. And many atheists and agnostics recognize that this is a hard problem to solve. It is by no means conclusively sorted. And David Chalmers, professor of philosophy and director of the Center for Consciousness in Australia, named it the hard problem of consciousness. Easy problems are explaining structures and functions to do with whatever state of consciousness you're looking at. But the hard problem is answering the question, how on earth do you get from brain to what it is like to be you. And Baroness Susan Greenfield, professor of physiology in Oxford, um, during a lecture in 2012 said this, how does the water of boring old brain cells and sludgy stuff translate into the wine of phenomenological subjective experience? How do you get from water to wine? And you can even make the case that the scientific method can't even access qualia, let alone give an account for it. Imagine you have a friend that goes to a music concert and they come back raving about what it was like to be there with all the strobe lights, with all of the, the music, the warm-up act, the main act, the sensory overload. And you're wishing that you'd bought a ticket and gone to this concert. But as the next best thing, you go and buy the reviews and you read in the papers and in magazines what it was like. Well, a scientist trying to study consciousness is a bit like the person reading the reviews. You can look at it after the fact, but you can't capture the event itself, what it was actually like for you at that moment. So science can't even access qualia, let alone account for them. There are also huge implications for free will, very sobering implications. If we are merely machines, then are we really free? Or do we just do what our brains tell us? Many answer yes. Many very bright people answer yes to this question. They say that free will is an illusion. But if true, how can we trust this very viewpoint? Surely it is simply a product of biochemical algorithms and therefore meaningless. You see, the view that free will is an illusion undermines itself and indeed everything out of our mouths. We could also say, does this view help make sense of the world around us? Well, not really. The human race seems to fight for its rights to strive for autonomy and wants to be in control. But why on earth pursue these things if free will is an illusion? This view does not help to explain the real world. Do we live as though free will is an illusion? We do not. Because if true, then no one need be held morally responsible for their actions. You are simply doing what your brain tells you. And yet we punish wrong behavior and reward good behavior precisely on the basis that people behaved in a certain way and yet could have chosen otherwise. We live as though our choices mean something. Next slide. In fact, the science and the data from the clinic is suggesting that the connection between mind and brain is much more complex than simply chalking it down to biochemistry. You see, what about when the brain is damaged but the mind is working? There was some gra back to the previous slide, please. There are some groundbreaking studies um, conducted at the University of Cambridge in 2006 and published in the prestigious journal Science, where Professor Adrian Owen studied patients in a persistent vegetative state to see if there was 
consciousness in these patients, despite having very damaged brains. He asked them to um, sh um, show that they were awake by responding, by imagining playing tennis. If you imagine playing tennis, you activate a whole network of areas related to actually playing tennis. And he also asked them to imagine moving around their house. And if you imagine moving around your house, you activate a series of networks that are related to spatial navigation. And then he said, okay, he asked them a series of biographical questions that could be verified with members of their family. If you want to answer yes, imagine you're playing tennis. If you want to answer no, imagine you're moving around your house. And he discovered that a small number of patients in a vegetative state were able to answer correctly these questions, suggesting that although their brain was deeply damaged, their mind was working. Well, that's a blow to the view that you are your brain, right? And as he said, um, next slide please, he, he said that we've discovered that 15 to 20% of people in the vegetative state are fully conscious. Although they never respond to any form of external stimulation, they appear to live entirely in their own world, devoid of thoughts or feelings. Many really are as oblivious and incapable of thought as their doctors believe, but a sizable number are experiencing something quite different, intact minds, deep within damaged bodies and brains. You see, the state of the brain and the state of the mind are two very different things. In reality, we live as though we do the thinking, not our brains. Brains don't think, algorithms don't think, people think. And there are actually other ways to describe the mind-brain relationship that make more sense of this. One way is to say that the mind emerges from the brain. The brain generates the mind when a number of component parts come together. Something new comes into being that is greater than the sum of its parts. We could use the example of a university. Um, a university begins, next slide please, with its building blocks of the, the, the core departments that make up that university, and that's where it starts from. But over time, it grows as it emits more and more students. It realizes, okay, we need to raise money, so we need a donor base. And then actually we've got students that have graduated, so we need an alumni network, and we need to start to incorporate international students, so we need to build that in. And the university grows to be greater than the sum of its original component parts. And that is kind of what this view is saying, that actually you only need the brain to generate the mind. And over time, as it grows in complexity, as personality develops, something emerges which is greater than the sum of its original parts. And the two are very much dependent on one another. But the problem with this view is this. How exactly does the brain generate the mind? How do neurons give rise to thoughts? And many believe that no amount of biochemical complexity gets you any closer to human experience. You can be as complex as you like. It's a different thing entirely. How do we cross the chasm? We are still faced with the hard problem of consciousness. Now, some Christians hold this view and they argue that the chasm can be crossed because we don't live in a closed system of cause and effect. Humans are made in the image of God, and paraphrasing Psalm 8, are closer to the angels than the rest of the animal kingdom. And if God exists, then there is hope for crossing the chasm. The third view is that the mind is beyond the brain. And this view believes that there are two kinds of substance. The mind is a non-physical substance and the brain is a physical substance. And the two are distinct, but they do interact. And this is known as substance dualism. A key proponent of this view was the 17th century mathematician and philosopher, René Descartes. And Descartes sought to 
figure out what properties of human existence are fundamental. And he concluded that the inner world of the person, the mind, is fundamental. And we need to explain everything else in relation to that. And that gave rise to his iconic statement, I think, therefore I am. This view, known as Cartesian dualism, received criticism eventually because it segmented humans into immaterial minds and physical bodies which seemingly have no relation to each other, often parodied as the ghost in the machine. Now, some reject a dualist outlook because they say it makes no sense of modern neuroscience today. Next slide. Mind and brain are not two separate things. They surely interact. So how could these two things interact? Well, some philosophers respond by saying there are holistic dualisms, that mind and brain are closely in relationship, even though they're distinct substances. The other um, objection that people raise is how can a non-physical mind interact with a physical brain? Well, we can say that we interact with non-physical things all the time. Our conversations are non-physical, even though they have sometimes a physical effect on us. There are even some illnesses known to clinicians today that have no physical traceable cause. They have no organic cause, and yet they have a huge effect on the person, something known as psychosomatic illness. So why not? a non-physical mind impacting a physical brain as well. And Michael Egnor, professor of neurosurgery for 30 years at Stony Brook School of Medicine in New York, comments that materialism, the view that matter is all that exists, is the premise of much contemporary thinking about what a human being is. Yet, evidence from the laboratory, the operating room, and clinical experience points to a less fashionable conclusion. Human beings straddle the material and immaterial realm. And in closing, a helpful way to think about the future of humanity is to think about origins. What does this all mean for the future of humanity. To make predictions about the future of humanity, we need to ask questions about the origins of humanity. To make predictions about the future of the human mind, we need to ask questions about the origins of the human mind. And of course, our beliefs determine how far back we look. If we believe that the natural world is all that there is, then our search for the origins of mind will remain within this world. But what if the origins of mind are more ancient than this? Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You see, if God exists, then mind and consciousness have always existed within the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And therefore, mind, the mind of God, is fundamental to the cosmos and is primary to humanity and everything else. And if that is true, then there is hope for solving the hard problem of consciousness. Genesis 2.7 says that the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. If God exists, then humans are not simply material, mechanical beings, but are breathed into by God. And if that is true then even if the most sophisticated algorithms improve our accuracy and efficiency in all kinds of areas, humans still have a unique contribution to make. Because the God of the Bible is a God who has made human beings with purpose, and therefore we still have a future. Thank you.
Thank you, Sharon, so much for that. That's fantastic. Um, as Sharon was speaking, a few people posted some questions on pigeonhole. Um, so please do have that open as a way of posing questions. We'll take those questions and we'll fold it into the panel discussion, uh, which will be coming up next, uh, and have Sharon address a few of those, um, along with some of the other panel when we're uh, discussing about the issues of artificial intelligence. Um, and this is one of the challenges of working with such a gifted team. Every time I listen to them, I feel artificially intelligent myself. Um, but uh, such is life. Um, what we're going to do now is just before we go into a short break, during which Sharon will be. I hope that you enjoyed Sharon's talk on God and neuroscience. My name is Laura Buchanan. I'm an itinerant speaker with the Zacharias Trust and blessed to be a colleague of Sharon's. The first thing for me to do is to point you in the direction of Sharon's new book, Am I Just My Brain, which is hot off the press. And you can get your copy at the discounted price of £6.79 if you go to the Good Book Company website. To explore the issues addressed by Sharon and other answers to questions of faith, um, go to the ZacharyasTrust.org website.